winnowing forks, separating the chaff from the, from the wheat, all those stories he tells, he's letting them know what's coming down the road. He's asking them to be prepared. But one of the things you need to know about this story is that in ancient Israel, or I should say wedding customs during the time of Jesus in Israel, the weddings were usually held in the evenings. And the reason they were held in the evenings is because it took, very, it took long to prepare. They didn't have caterers, per se. They didn't have a wedding planner. It was usually the family getting enough tables having to borrow stuff from other families to bring it in. So they needed a lot of time to get things ready. And lamps were used because they did not have electricity. And they used oil lamps. Now the oil lamps that they used tended to be torches, just like you would see in one of the old movies where they, they wrap a stick with, with a rag and dip it in oil and they light it. Well, those things burn out really fast. So you have to have extra rags and you have to have extra oil. And usually the bridegroom would arrive late because his day consisted of this. Going to the bride's parents and arguing about the bride price. What he paid for the bride. You only gave us one donkey. We expected a donkey, a goat, and a sheep. And they would argue for hours and hours. So you never knew when he was going to show up. And the bridesmaids would go to the bridegroom's house and would escort him with their lamps to the wedding feast. And that's something that everyone that he's telling this story to would understand. He tells it because it's familiar to everybody there. He tells it because they can all relate to it. And he tells it because he wants them to be prepared. But here's the thing. He's not just talking to his disciples. This story, you know, before there was a Bible, this story was passed down and passed down by word of mouth. Just like the Old Testament, before there was a Bible. You recall reading in the Old Testament, there's a lot of times where you'll see, Abraham said this, blah, blah, blah. And what Abraham said was, blah, blah, blah. And it's the same blah, blah, blah. Why? Because it's a verbal story. You have to remember it. So they would repeat a lot of things just so you would remember. And here's the thing. They passed it from little church to little church. Remember, the churches at that time usually consisted of a house with a group of people there. They would pass these stories on. But once the Bible took over, that's what we use to get these stories. That doesn't mean you can't go out and tell them. Though. We need to be prepared. So what does this mean for us? Well, it's a difficult parable to hear for many reasons. The first one is, the bridesmaids are both wise and foolish. Now, how many people sitting here today are going to raise their hand and tell me that they're foolish? No? No one? <laughs> Yay, we got one. See, most of us like to think of ourselves as wise. Most of us like to think of ourselves as being the person that can get it done or being the person that can get someone to get it done. That's what we like to think. However, I have it on good authority that every single person in here, with the exception of my wife, has done something foolish. Well, actually, my wife did something foolish. She married me. But <laughs> let's not go there. Anyway. We've all done things that are foolish, and we've all been the person that has needed something and has not had it. We've all gone on a trip, and gotten there at the end of the trip, and opened up our suitcase and discovered 
we forgot to put our socks in. We've all done something. And the foolish are being shut out. We don't like to think of Jesus as shutting anyone out. When we talk about Jesus, we talk about forgiveness. We talk about grace. We talk about mercy. We talk about a lot of things, but shutting people out is not one of them. Excuse me. So we never like to think of them as being shut out. We never like to think that there's a possibility that we could be the people on the outside of the door saying, Lord, Lord, let us in. And he being on the other side saying, truly I tell you, I do not know you. I don't want to be that person. So I need to be prepared, right? So what does that mean? What does it mean to be prepared for when the Lord comes? You know, we're called to a state of, of alertness for God's plans. You know the saying, mankind plans, God laughs. There's a lot of things that happen in this world that we have no control over. And they're worldly things. They're things of the mortal kingdom, not things of the heavenly kingdom. We need to be working ourselves and our faith towards the heavenly kingdom. We need to include God in what we do. And for us, it should be rather easy. For us, we have, we have the only example of God that has ever visited this earth. We have Jesus Christ. We have the stories of Jesus Christ. We know what it is that he is asking of us. The thing is, are we doing the things that he's asking of us? You know my saying, going to church and calling yourself a Christian is like standing in a garage and calling yourself a car. Just going to church doesn't cut it. And remember all the times when Jesus heals someone and he says, repent, sin no more? He's not saying repent as in, I'm sorry. Repent doesn't mean I'm sorry. Repent means to change, to change your ways. To change the way you do things. Now maybe most of you are doing something based on what Jesus has taught throughout your life. But there are some of us that can improve. Myself included. I try to love my neighbor. Even though their fence is falling down into my yard. Even though they park so that I can't get out of my driveway. I live on a circle. Right? I mean, it's easy to love the neighbors on the other side. And I try to love God. But loving, well, let me put it to you this way. Love is a verb, not a noun. Love requires action. It's not a state. It's a verb. How do you show love for God? You show love for God, if you remember two weeks ago, when the Pharisees asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was. And he 
he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. But he also added, almost as important is loving your neighbor as yourself. That's the key. And who is your neighbor? Is it just the people in this room? Or is it everyone? It's even the atheist. The atheist is your neighbor. It's even the, the, the terrorist. The terrorist is your neighbor. That's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? Love. That's how we become prepared for when Christ comes. By loving our neighbor as ourselves. Amen. We have an alternative methodology now for the offering. There is a plate on the back table. If you have not already done so and you have an envelope or, or money or whatever you want to give, please stand up, go to the back table and put it in the plate. And when we're done, Wayne will bring it forward to me. Please join Connie and Marge in our closing hymn, We Are God's People, found in the faith we sing, number 2220.
service is over, and now, as we go forth, remember, the love of Christ is within you, and we need to spread that love to all our neighbors.